So now we want to take a step back and see uh, what the number systems that we've invented really mean and whether there's any way to represent a negative number given the number systems that we're making use of. Uh, so we recall that in a binary number representation, if we're representing an integer, each bit corresponds to a place value of 2 to the power of n. And so if there's a 1 there, then you have that power of 2. If there's a 0 there, you don't have that power of 2. But there's no way to make a negative number. Uh, because you can't subtract values away, all you can do is add them. And so we want to find some way to make a signed number, because in computers we have these numbers, these signed numbers. We have unsigned integers, but we also have signed integers that allow us to store negative and positive numbers. This new idea of a signed number in binary has to be able to represent positive numbers and negative numbers in the same context and still has to be a, a mathematical system that, that makes sense. So we're going to walk through a couple of the sort of precursors to the one that we use today uh, and see what the inspiration was for these things uh, and where they sort of maybe go wrong a little bit and why we use uh, the one that we use today, which is two's complement. This is the standard uh, signed number representation that has all sorts of amazing advantages, really, really clever. So uh, the first sort of obvious guess when it comes to making a number that is negative uh, is the same thing we do in our base 10 system, which is to add a new symbol, uh, the negative symbol that causes a number to be negative, right? We have, if we have a number like uh, 38, uh, then to make it negative, we just put a new symbol there, negative 38. And that's great. That works fine in uh, base 10 when there's no problem inventing new symbols. But in base 2, we don't have any new symbols. All we have is 0 and 1. So if we have a number like this that corresponds to a positive number and we want to make it a negative number, we can't just put a negative in front of it. There aren't any more symbols. All we have is 0 and 1. So we invent a new system called sine magnitude. Uh, that instead of making a negative making a negative uh, symbol, we use another bit and treat that as if it were a negative symbol. So we add a new bit at the very front of our representation, and then we just say, if that bit is 0, that's going to correspond to a positive number. If that bit is 1, that's going to correspond to a negative number. Why that choice? Well, we already have the situation where adding zeros in front of a number doesn't change its value. And so we want that to be the case here. We add a zero in front of the number, it doesn't change its value. We add a one in front of the number, that's gonna mean it's a negative number. So that seems like a reasonable idea. How does that work? Well, the each bit position is still gonna to correspond to some power of two. And then we use this value at the front to tell us whether it's a one for negative or a zero for positive. The challenge with this is that it's introducing an enormous amount of complexity that's going to be a lot of work to deal with. Here's the process for calculating a subtraction, or an addition for that matter, using the sine magnitude representation. First, we have to look at both numbers, and we have to say, are they positive or negative? And then, based on the sign of those numbers, we have to decide what operation we're actually going to be asked to do. So, for example, if you have a negative x minus y, this is actually negative x plus y. So although it looks like we're subtracting, in fact, we're adding. And so we have to figure that out. We have to design logic that will identify this is actually an addition. And so we perform an addition. And then we allocate the sign to that addition when we're done. So that's a lot of work, a lot of logic to design. Um, it's, it's an involved process. There's another problem with sine magnitude. And that is that with sine magnitude, you have a zero which can be positive or negative. And this is actually very problematic because if there's more than one way to represent zero, then we have to build in all sorts of extra logic to check if the answer to a, uh, to a problem is zero. And often we're gonna wanna do that. For example, if we're you know, going through a loop and counting down a counter to zero, we wanna know when it reaches zero. And if there's two ways to represent zero, that just makes our logic that much more complicated. So this is a nice idea, and it's sort of a naive first guess that many people will, will attempt, uh, but it doesn't actually work as well as you might think. The second sort of naive idea is called the simple complement. This idea of a complement being the opposite of a number can be used to sort of expand into base two, and the complement of a number being the opposite or being the negative. Um, and you can already sort of see maybe that the idea sounds good, but the problems are numerous. 
for one thing, each bit doesn't correspond to a uh, power of two anymore. This is actually uh, one, two, four, eight. So we'd have to know that this is a negative number, otherwise we'd think it was positive nine. And negative six and positive nine, meaning the same thing, is gonna be a real problem. Um, for specifically, this looks odd, right? It looks like this is an odd number. We have this lowest bit corresponding to how many ones are in the number, and we use that as a sort of a proxy to tell us whether or not that number is odd. And if that doesn't work anymore, that's gonna mess up a whole bunch of our logic. So we want the logic that we've developed so far to stay the same. We don't wanna to have to have an entirely new system for positive integers and negative integers. We'd like to have a system that will tack on the concept of negativity into our existing system. So we do that with what we call the radix complement. Now I'm gonna go away from the notes for a minute and try to just walk it through on paper. I encourage you to walk through the notes and see um, the, the, what I've put there. Uh, the idea is to explain it in base 10 first in the notes and then in base two. But let me just show you really quickly and simply the idea. So the idea of a radix complement or a twos complement starts with the premise of we don't want to have to subtract. Subtraction is bad. It's a whole new thing we have to add in. We don't want to have to even have really numbers that are negative. I mean, we'll have to have numbers that are negative, but we want to be able to subtract by adding. We want to be able to avoid representing uh, negative numbers in a new way. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a number, uh, say, uh, positive 7, and we're going to say this positive 7, we're going to make negative by subtracting it from some really big number. Let's subtract it from... Uh, one, two, four, eight, six, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. We'll subtract it from thirty-two, say, okay. And then this is going to give us a new number that is going to be the representation for the value of negative seven, because we've got negative seven in here. Uh, that's the value we're going to use. But when we subtract it from this really big number, we're going to get a new number that we're going to use as negative seven. Now. Don't forget, we want to get rid of subtraction. So I understand the irony of having to subtract in order to get rid of subtraction, but let's see what number we get. So this is this number, and we're going to subtract this number. And what do we get? Well, zero minus one, oh, we can't do it. So we have to borrow, and there's nothing there, and there's nothing there, and there's nothing there. So we're going to borrow from here. This is going to become two. We'll borrow from here. This will become two. Borrow from here. This will become two. We'll borrow from here, this will become two. We'll borrow from here, this will become two. And I encourage you to go back and look at your subtraction notes if you're having trouble with that. But then we have two minus one, two minus one is one. And then we have one minus one is zero, one minus one is zero, one minus zero is one, one minus zero is one, and that one goes away. So what we get is one, two, four, eight, and 16. So 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24, 25, 25. But what we're going to say is that this is actually going to be negative 7. Now, how can 25 be negative 7? We're going to do this by saying any number that's going to be smaller than this great big number we're subtracting from is going to be a valid number. And anything that isn't smaller than that isn't going to be a valid number. We, just, we have to sort of take a a range of numbers and allow it to be valid because any if we allow any number in this then there's going to be difficulties in describing what number is positive and what number is negative we have to start by saying our values are going to be this particular size then we have this subtraction of seven from this big number and that's going to give us our new value but we don't want to actually change the value do we because if we subtract the number um, from this great big number right this is seven and this is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. 32 take away 7 isn't the number we started with. It's 25. So we have to somehow get that number back again if it's going to work properly. So instead, what we're going to do, we added this 10,000 here. We're going to subtract this number again. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We're going to subtract this number out again. And we're going to just keep track of that subtraction in our mathematics. This has now created a positive number, so we don't have to subtract. We can do this math, and as long as we remember to subtract the 32 again when we're done, then it'll be okay, because 25 minus 32 gives us 
minus 7, which is the number we're interested in. So what we've done is instead of just having the number 25 be minus 7, we're having 25 minus 32 be minus 7, which it is, right? We just have to remember that we're subtracting 32. And then we can use that 25, okay? So we're going to put that 32 back in the representation as a negative number uh, so that we don't forget to use that. That's the real kick of this uh, process is that we maintain this uh, negative 32 as a number in the representation. We don't have to remember to keep it around. It's already built in. So what we do is we say 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. We're going to say this number, 32, is going to be put into our representation as a negative number. So let's see what that means. 1, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0 is going to be equal to now negative 32. And then we put the rest of this in, which is our 25, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. And so our final number, whoops, our final number that's going to correspond to negative 7 is negative 32 plus 25. This is negative 32 plus 25 which is negative seven. So this is how we're gonna represent negative numbers now. This number here is gonna be our result for negative seven. It seems like a lot of work and it seems like an odd way to do it, but the end result of putting a negative number into our uh, two's complement representation is gonna give us some real interesting advantages. And we're going to look at those advantages in the next video.